It's been confirmed. The lifeboats have been disabled. No one survived. I am so sorry, Lady A moment Denizen. of silence, please. I'll always be here, as I always have been. How often does it end like this? How often do we choose this? You always do. Is anyone truly free? And how would you know when you weren't? Can you believe what you see? And how would you know if you couldn't? Demerzel is a character who understands the specific limitations that prevent her freedom. And from its introduction, Ignis was a place where you knew you couldn't trust anything you saw. Way back in episode 6, there was what seemed like a quick turn by Gail, where she went from an impasse on the beggar with Talum to telling Harry that the Mentalics would only follow one of their own and that he should let her take the lead. There was a lot of other stuff going on at the same time. The distortion on the screen, and the ruse that followed that made Salvor think Harry left on their ship. But this quick change of heart by Gail felt more like the show was withholding information which made it stand out. Then in episode 8, there is a moment where Tellum wants to put everything else aside and get honest for a minute. She knows that Gail knew that Harry was dead since the moment it happened, and wants her to confirm that she felt him drowning. Obviously, Tellum doesn't care about Harry or how his death affected Gale. She's just interested in her body and her power. So when Gale responds that she felt the water filling her lungs and that she felt everything, Tellum is way too interested in the idea that she could access suffering over a distance and that she could hide the truth to realize that she never says that she felt him die. Withholding this detail turns out to be very important because as we learned at the end of the last episode, he didn't. And that sets the stage for a host of twists and reveals to close out Foundation's second season. The season 2 finale opens by showing us that Gail did indeed feel Harry drowning, but was able to use her mentalic powers to save him. On the spectrum of reveals that relied on us not having the necessary information to sort things out, I would say this one hits just about right. It never really made sense that they would put Harry in a new body just to kill him off. There are several clues like the ones I just mentioned that you can go back and pick up on, and unlike when Salvor had her mind switched off in the water at the end of episode Episode 7, they did enough with Harry's flashback to make you think this might be his ending. To save him and to conceal that fact from a planet of people who can look inside your mind, Gail had to use everything that she picked up from Tellum in their confrontation on the beggar. She had to give the mentalic left to guard Harry a need to help him. They had to take advantage of that, they had to kill him, and then smother his attempts to reach out with his unvoice, while after the fact they had to create an illusion to make him look like Harry. Then they had to get the real Harry back through tens of kilometers worth of dense terrain, which required that they build a bridge of shared sensations, knowing all the while that any slip could draw the mentalic's attention. This explains why Gail was acting so strangely towards Salvor in episode 207. They are able to pull all this off. Harry shows up at the last minute to end Tellum and save Gale and Salvor. Once that happens, the Mentalics show up and Josiah tries to assure them that now that she's gone, they don't need to fear them. They explain that she was bending them to her will, and now for the first time since they arrived on Ignis, they feel free. It takes some convincing, but in the end, they come around and open the door, and almost like it's a reflex, the Mentalics bow down to their liberators, which brings to mind Harry's quip about people liking to kneel. After that, things appear to be pretty good. Developing a second foundation was a crucial part of Harry's plan, and the Mentalics should have the skills necessary to become that. Salvor looks happy, she's smiling and she's bonding with the kids. You could see a future for her there amongst these people where she would finally fit in. This piece is short-lived because we find out Tellum managed to jump into Josiah's body as she was dying. She takes control and grabs a gun and tries to shoot Gale. Salvor sees what's happening and jumps in the middle, throwing Rach's knife to stop him, but she also gets shot and starts to bleed out in the process. With the life draining out of Josiah's body, he says he can feel Tellum getting weaker and dying with him. 
This feels like a definitive ending for Tellum, but I suppose you never know with a character with those kinds of powers. Salvor's situation is even less ambiguous. Gale and Harry rush to her side, but her condition deteriorates quickly. And while this is shocking and sad, Salvor herself sees this as good news because now they know they can change the future. With her final word, she says, Mom, Mom, don't you see what this means? It means we're not trapped. You were right. The future can be changed. You could still get it back on the right course. I have absolute faith in... And she dies before she finishes that sentence. Absolute faith in Gale, Harry, psycho history, or all of the above. It doesn't really matter because she dies with a sense that she's made a contribution to the future through her sacrifice. They burn her body on a funeral pyre to give her a proper send-off. And while Josiah and Salvor are the first characters I've mentioned who don't survive the finale, they're definitely not the last. And speaking of sacrifice, there is plenty of that to go around on the Destiny. Terminus has been reduced to a cracked globe floating in space. And Brother Day is right where we left him, basking in the glow of his incredible display of power. There isn't much anyone else can do but look on in horror, which only increases when they find out this is just the beginning. After making Brother Constant list the names of the other planets that have joined the Foundation's cause, Brother Day issues the command to jump to Thespis to destroy that next. This choice introduces some additional cruelty given that Constant's family has roots there. But this is one of those situations where you don't exactly want to give him credit for choices he's made because he just destroyed a planet. But from his perspective, trying to eradicate what he describes as a cancer waiting to metastasize makes a sort of sense. At the end of episode 9, I thought, well, they have had over a hundred years to prepare. And even if this is the plan going all the way wrong, there must have been a non-zero chance of this happening, which means that they would have factored it in. They've been spreading out all this time, so who knows, maybe the people on the planet will be a sacrifice, and their martyrdom will inspire generations of future Foundationers. We'll talk about how the reality is more complicated than that in a bit, but Brother Day doesn't have any additional information to work with here. So strategically, you can see why he makes this choice. And then let's not forget that this is exactly who Empire is. Demerzel left him behind when she went to Trantor to deal with more pressing matters because she knows this. Her absence reminds us of the scene in the second episode of the series, where she talks to a young Cleon the 13th after his predecessor committed an atrocity against Anacreon and Thespis. The child asks her how often does it end like this? How often do we choose this? And she answers matter-of-factly that they always do. Regardless, this is a line too far, and Bel Rios finally refuses his order after he realizes that there's no talking Day out of it. This earns him a slap and some taunting before Day turns to Shiben's light and threatens to kill everyone on board if she doesn't make the jump. She agrees, but instead initiates a jump sequence that results in the ships jumping into the space occupied by the next closest ship and starting a chain reaction that will destroy the entire fleet. This came about through a secret deal that Hober struck with the spacers who concealed the sequence in that mark on his wrist. Again, this information was withheld from the audience. And it did seem odd at the time she as center was so quick to turn down the offer, and now we know that she didn't. This isn't an easy choice to make. As Day points out, this is a suicide. Every one of those ships has a spacer on it that will have to give their life so that their kind can be free. She Bends Light tells him it's a small price to pay for that freedom, and this recontextualizes her brief meeting with her mother when they met to turn over Hober. While no one on board can be happy about the situation they're in, I imagine they all enjoyed watching as Hober explains how this was their plan from the beginning, and that Day walked right into it because he's so predictable. He adds that Bell half figured it out, but twists the knife a little bit more by adding that Day never listens to him. If you're keeping track, this is the third destruction of Cleon the 17th self-image in quick succession, and he decides that this will be the last. Once he finds out he can't escape, he starts beating the hell out of Hober. Bell jumps in and does a little better, but also gets a pretty serious thrashing. And if you could say one good thing about this Cleon, it would be that he has a jaw on him. 
He manages to throw Bell into the airlock and spaces him, but at the last minute, Bell activates the castling device so that Day turns out to be the one hurling to a quick end in the vacuum of space. The setup makes for a satisfying end. You knew the castling device would play a part as soon as Hober explained how it worked on Corel, and you get this great shot of the body floating in front of the backdrop of the destroyed Terminus, and the fact that the castling device switches their clothes means that the Imperial corpse looks like it's wearing shorts as it drifts away. While this is a victory of sorts, everyone on the ship is still going to die. Well, almost everyone. Bell explains that even though the ship's escape pods are locked down, that there is an external cleaning module that has room for one person and a day's worth of breathable air. Hober insists that Constant takes it because of the kind of person she is, and because his role in the plan is done. In light of the fact that they think everyone on Terminus is dead, he makes the accurate assessment that she has a way of making people feel hope, and he puts a personal spin on things saying that he always wanted to shorten the darkness, but he just couldn't take the religious stuff, and she reminded him of who he used to be. While this is all quite heavy and comes with a moving goodbye kiss, Constance seizes the moment to use some of that charm to lighten things up. First, she rags on him for denying her a martyr's death, And then, as she gets ready to depart, she asks if he still wants to know her name. Of course he does, so she lies and says it's Hope, just so when he asks if that's true, then she can say that it's not, but wouldn't that be something? Which all works to give their relationship a fitting ending. Hober and Belle decide to try the lock rewind as they wait for the chain reaction to claim them. This is the second item Hober has been carrying around since we first met him that you knew would have to come back up. Bell shines the best light he can on their predicament. A few weeks ago, he thought he might die in a prison colony, so at least there's a poetry to going down with the ship. Glaywin comes up and Hober expresses sympathy about what he had to do there. And Bell explains that they were doomed from the beginning and they knew it. It was just them against the long arm of history and there was never any way Day would let them live. But there was honor in the dying, and he did get to shove Day out of an airlock. And if you haven't noticed by now, this is all elevated just a little bit because he's swimming in Day's chainmail. They do finally open the bottle, and Bell proposes the toast. Here's to those who fight and ask why, which is a tribute to Glaywin, who said the same thing during the toast at Doosan Bar's place. The wine tastes terrible, which is funny in its own right, but it also sets up one final moment to show who these characters are. They both try to play it off until Hober faces the reality that it's just bad. Bell notices that in the wake of that revelation, he can see fear on Hober's face and he takes the moment to come up with a joke to help him relax. He asks what the name of that horrifying creature on his ship was and then says that the wine tastes like Becky's asshole. From there, they amend the toast, they share that moment, and then the destiny explodes to end their stories. Two other characters that never really had a chance to survive the finale were Rue and Dusk. Demerzel returns to Trantor thanks to an alarm that lets her know someone entered her former prison. Initially, Dusk behaves like you might expect from a Cleon. He's still upset after finding out that he was mostly a throne warmer. And when he accuses Demerzel of puppeteering the whole show, that opens the door for her to explain what that really means. She points out the resentment he has that his memories were curated, and how he takes for granted that his feelings are entirely his own. If he feels lust or love, he doesn't have to wonder where that feeling comes from. This isn't the case for Demerzel. In his advanced age, Cleon Leon the First chose to remember his coercion of Demerzel as communion, while she can't forget anything. And because he changed her programming, when she thinks of him, she longs for him. What's more, she remembers him as the little boy she first met. Through her stories and their interactions, she tried to shape him and can see how that influenced the man he became. She says he was noble, thoughtful, and passionate, and that he wasn't dawn or day or dusk, but the whole journey of the sun across the sky. While she goes through this, it feels very human when she says that he looked at her with such desire as though she were a mystery he would sacrifice anything to solve, or that he rescued her and she loved him. These are statements of fact that are hard to apply to a sentient machine's experience, which is something that is completely foreign to us. You tend to take her at her word because she really doesn't gain any type of advantage by being dishonest. 
As Ruin does start to become affected by what she says, she explains that as she experiences these things, she also knows that they're the result of her programming. So she's left to wonder if it weren't for this directive, would she feel the same way? Would she feel anything? She'll never know, and she hates him for that. Rue suggests that if the marriage happens, the dynasty will end and she could be free. And while this does seem to be the only way she can get out of the prison that she's currently in, and she certainly wants it to come to an end, her programming prevents her from helping them. It also means that she would destroy them if they tried to reprogram her. She can't even erase their memories because she knows Cloud Dominion has the ability to restore them. They realize that she hired the Blind Angels to attempt to assassinate Day in the Season 2 premiere, and that she didn't do it because she wanted them to succeed. She just wanted to be able to pin the attempt on Sarath to get her out of the way. While she explains this, it cuts to a scene with Sarath in the gardens being taken into custody by Markley, who she thought was her man on the inside. Rue makes a desperate attempt to run away and Demerzel immediately grabs her wrist and pulls her back. You hear the bones in her arm breaking from her grip and at this point, Dusk realizes that they were never getting out of there alive. And when she questions him about Dawn, he says that he doesn't know anything about the chamber. Dusk walks over to her and puts his hands on her face while gazing into her eyes. He tells her that he forgives her, that none of them were ever free, and that they were fools to think they ever would be. He puts his arms around her and she reciprocates. And as they step back, she says that she remembers him when he was just one year old. He pointed up to the sky to show her the sun. He was so proud as if he just discovered it, and he was sharing it with her. He says it was because he loved her and that he still does. They share a last look and we see more tears from her in another situation where you can't see why she would pretend to cry as she did for Emperor Aberanus. Dusk holds Rue and Demersel steals herself and gets ready to kill them. Then you see a reverse angle with her walking away where she looks devastated. And as the camera closes in on her face, you can make out that dissonance that comes from the conflicts related to her programming. All things considered, it looked like Dawn and Sarath would share a similar fate. When Dawn finds out that Sarath had been taken into custody, he tries to intervene. Demerzel assures him that based on the evidence against her, there's nothing they can do. And what's interesting here is that Dawn would regain his place in the line of succession if he just played along. But that's not really what we would expect the youngest exponent to do. Luckily, in his final moments, when he was telling Demerzel that he loved her, Brother Dusk used the green chroma to put the traitor's mark on Demerzel's neck. When Dawn sees this, he backs off and just acts like he agrees with Demerzel's plans rather than trying to set Sarath free right there, and then waits to go to her room to try to free her and make a break for her shuttle. Demerzel is watching the Imperial fleet die on the hollow display as her really bad day continues. The way that she's clutching her Luminism bracelet and the way that she demands a moment of silence when someone says that there'll be no survivors really highlight how difficult these situations are to navigate. On top of all of that, an aide comes in to show her that Dawn and Sarath are addressing a crowd and making a statement. This just turns out to be her servants wearing face scramblers, but they manage to announce that Day is dead and that the two of them are planning to marry. Demerzel cuts the transmission and the real Dawn calls her from the Cloud Dominion shuttle. He knows that she killed Dusk and that her programming would require her to chase after him, but wonders if there might not be room for interpretation. If they were killed, might that not turn people against Empire? While the conflicts and dissonance have Demerzel shaking, she still contends that the public will forget their brief attachment to them after she decants a new dawn. Sarah thinks that the idea of an ascending emperor escaping with his bride and their naturally conceived heir makes for a good story. Hearing this, Dawn is just thrilled to learn he's a father which is a nice turnaround from him trying to talk Day out of doing the same thing in the first episode of the season. Demerzel, who now looks thoroughly spun out, does something akin to babbling when she starts talking about how his heir is merely a cluster of dividing cells, and even if it survives, it may be an unfit leader. Dawn insists that he wouldn't have to lead, he would just have to be loved, and it's here that Demerzel starts to break down in a way. 
He acknowledges that her feelings are hard to ascertain, but says that he hopes that she's happy for him because she really is the closest thing to a mother he ever had. He knows that she was programmed to be that way, but likes to believe that she would still be that way even without it. It's another example where she'll never know because that compulsion to serve was forced on her. And we see Sarath and Dawn lean in to embrace each other as the shuttle clears the orbital rings and Demerzel lets them leave. It's not the only happy ending, but it might be the one that will turn out to be the least divisive. Because we do catch back up with Constant, who we see praying herself right out of air, only for the Vault to swoop in and rescue her. It doesn't seem like a surprise that the Vault and Digital Harry survived, because while the Vault's tech is borderline magic, but when she goes inside, the first thing she sees is Polly, who we saw was reserved to die at the end of the last episode as the Invictus was crashing into the surface of Terminus right in front of him. When she asks, she finds out that it's not just him, but pretty much everyone on the planet was ushered to safety inside the vault, and now they're all on their way to somewhere new. Dr. Selden appears to explain that the plan was always to sacrifice Terminus so that the Foundation would survive. This brings us back to those ideas of withholding information and difficult sacrifices, maybe with less emphasis on the sacrifice in this situation, and it also makes a fair amount of sense. By destroying the Imperial fleet and setting the spacers free, the Foundation situation is incredibly improved. If you think back to that moment when Demerzel was watching it happen, that is her trying to process the implications of losing the fleet. Trantor will nearly be cut off and the entire galaxy will be in the market for whisper ship technology they can only get from the Foundation. It's a master stroke that shifts the balance of power while getting them through the second crisis and will eliminate the need for the Church of Selden as a recruitment tool going forward. While that's all true, I do have some feelings about how this came together, which I'll come back to. Things end there for the first foundation while they're only getting started for the second. While trying to process Salvor's death, Gale takes the Prime Radiant, trying to find signs that her daughter's sacrifice may have nudged the plan somewhere. Harry reminds her that they can never know in the present, and while her head knows that, her heart needs to know that this loss mattered. Harry laments that they're trying to save humanity while they can't even save the ones they love. And when he brings up Yana, you realize how this rescue exposed their minds to each other. The experience brought them to a new place in their relationship. She's actually seen those memories at this point. So when he tells her that they take the pain and the loss and they weave it into a narrative that propels them forward, we know that it comes from this newfound communion. She wants him to tell her that the plan can still work, and he does without hesitation. He adds that there are an infinite amount of ways to arrive at the inevitable, which reinforces what she knows about the math, but is also a subtle confirmation that Salvor's loss did matter. Demerzel's work is not done. She decants three more clones. As they come online, she tells them that she never had to do all three at once, but not to worry. She has a new tool to help them, and she reveals that she brought the Prime Radiant back to Trantor with her and opens it. She almost looks mesmerized while she's looking into it, and the exponents ask if she can understand it. Not all of it, not yet, but she can already see that wonderful things lie ahead. Back on Ignis, Harry wants Gale to enter cryosleep so that they can send her to the point where she'll face off with the mule. The gift that Salvor gave them is that his victory isn't assured. He briefly suggests that they create a new fake religion on Ignis with Gale as its deity. He would stay behind and develop the second foundation, teaching them psychohistory, and they could wake her up once a year to check on things. Gale has no interest in becoming a goddess, which is precisely what Salvor was worried about, and she doesn't want to do it that way because one year she would wake up just to find out that Harry had died. She believes she might be able to defeat the mule, but what if there were a different crisis against the other Harry Selden down the road? She'll need him for that, and so they agree to train the second foundation, and then after a year or so they'll enter cryosleep together. After that, there's a small time jump to when they enter the pods. That's followed by a title card that says 152 years later. We see the mule in a room talking to himself about Gale. 
He says she visited me in a thousand dreams. Now she's here in our time at my throat. And you can't help but notice the differences in this look at the mule. In Gale's vision, he was attacking and he looked nearly invincible. But in this, he appears to fear her. He says he has to find her first and he has to destroy her, even if he has to burn everything to do it. And the season ends there. Season 2 came out of the gate swinging and somewhere in the middle got on this trajectory where each episode outdid the last one. That's a situation that is not sustainable, but it made for a much improved experience over the first season and delivered what I consider the best episode of the series in number 209, Long Ago Not Far Away. All of the new characters were memorable, and whenever things move on from this time period and the next season picks up, I will miss seeing them. There were still parts I liked better than others, but they closed the distance between them and things were interesting across the board. I was shocked to see Salvor die and surprised at how much the character grew on me this season. Don making his escape and the way that his goodbye to Demerzel built off of Dusk's turned out to be a one-two punch I didn't see coming. And while it works just for what it is, there's that extra layer of Demerzel figuring out later that even if what Dusk was saying was true there, he was also manipulating her so that he could make that mark at the same time. So many character stories came to an end. Bell and Hober, Talum and Josiah, and even the sperm in his short pants. R.I.P.'s across the board with some really great performances from all of them. I really enjoyed the way they use the idea of agency inside the larger story that is so much about inevitability. Exploring the idea that no one is truly free while expanding on Demerzel's backstory with Cleon made for a lot of fascinating moments. There is so much interesting character work going on there that you can't stop thinking about, and it let Laura Byrne loose to deliver the series' best performance to date. I have several questions based on what the show is showing us, more questions based on how I think about the character from the books, and all of these scenes in the last two episodes were so compelling that while I'm watching, I almost don't care where they go from here. At the same time, Dr. Selden knowing she's a robot and successfully giving her the Prime Radiant cranks up the levels of intrigue. And you've got a pregnant Sarath carrying a part of Empire out there somewhere. That will have to lead to something, as will Constant and Hober's time together. So while most of these characters will be long gone when Season 3 picks up, there will still be pieces of them out there. I thought the way they brought Harry back worked better than it had any right to. The Hober thing was also surprising, but felt set up when you think about it in hindsight. That's also where you start to think about how they're piling up all of these shocking twists. One big surprise, okay. Two, well, now, wait a minute, can we believe anything we saw in that amazing ninth episode? Then we get to the vault and it starts to feel borderline dishonest. Terminus's end felt shocking and what appeared to be Polly's final moments were absolutely moving. You could argue that anything less wouldn't have sold it, and you might be right. And as I said before, the way Dr. Selden planned things out makes sense, and I actually like that. But this is still effectively a fake out. They showed us one thing, and then the reality turned out to be something else. Whether you enjoy that type of thing or not will come down to taste. Personally, I'm not a fan because generally speaking, it feels like it negates all those feelings I had watching Terminus being destroyed. And that has the potential to have me question everything I'm seeing going forward. This does resemble that last minute, it was all part of the plan spirit that you get from a lot of the crises in Asimov's writing. But at the same time, it resembles that moment when you thought Glenn got killed on The Walking Dead. One of those works, and the other has people quit your show in droves. Where this got to me was when Seth Cermak emerged in the vault to greet Constant. Here was a character I was sure I watched die after he'd been stabbed after this great turnaround where he helped Polly, and it was just a perfect ending for the character. As he's there bleeding out in his husband's arms, I realized that he went from being a character I didn't pay much attention to, to one whose death mattered. That's fantastic. Great TV. And in my mind, there's no reason to undo that. Constant wouldn't be alone, and she could mourn his death as another sacrifice with Pater, 
and the show is probably jumping ahead to where we won't see him again anyway. So I imagine this choice to have everyone on Terminus be saved, and more importantly, to present it in this way, might be divisive. And we'll just come down to taste on whether or not you thought the twist justified the misdirection. Overall, there was enough that I really liked in season two to where I can say, okay, this is the season where you wanted to lean into the idea of withholding information. It makes sense thematically. You can get away with that one time. It's the whole idea of fool me once and so on. But now let's go back to a place where we know we can trust what we're seeing. One thing is for certain, in 152 years, not that much will be the same at all. There were some major events here that will change the course of psychohistory and the Empire's general direction, and I still am looking forward to seeing how that plays out. There's still a lot to talk about, about the season, about this finale. I did have another conversation with showrunner and executive producer David S. Goyer, which will be coming out in about 24 hours. I'll be putting out my video about the questions I have going into season three. And I'm going to be doing a live stream on Friday night Eastern time with my friends from Bald Move where you guys can come and ask us some questions and we can all sort of process it together. So the season has come to an end, but there's still a lot to come. And I think that's a great place to leave things. Please like this video if you enjoyed it. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. And thanks for watching. I'll talk to you soon.